Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. This week is certainly a classic in one sense of the word. It's ECW's December to Dismember 2006, taking place on December 3rd at the James Brown Arena in Augusta, Georgia. This is nominated by Joel Ma. Joel, thanks so much for the suggestion. This show is known for a lot of unenviable statistics, one of which being it had a very, very low attendance figure of 4,800, and I'll get to that in a minute, but also a very low buy rate. In fact, it's the lowest buy rate in company history pre-network era. About 90,000 pay-per-view buys. A little more than half of them were domestic. So yeah, not very good here. But there were a couple of reasons for that number in defense of the show. One of which, obviously, the build was not very good. Only two matches were announced ahead of time. But really a big part of that is the bigger issue is that this pay-per-view took place one week. Only seven days after Survivor Series. So fans just plopped down, you know, 40 bucks for Survivor Series, one of the big four, one of the bigger shows of the year. And then you expect fans to pay another 30 or 40 dollars for another pay-per-view like a single brand pay-per-view in ECW and so I think fans weren't really able or willing to do that and this was really 2006 was really the worst of the brand split 1.0 in this regard the fact there was just a glut of single brand pay-per-views I think this year alone they were in 18 pay-per-views in total that's way too many that's way more than one a month and that's I think a reason why this show one of the many reasons this show didn't do so well in terms of numbers also going back to the attendance thing only 48 in attendance, which sounds like a low number, and it certainly is, but then again, the James Brown Arena in Augusta was not a very large arena. It is not, it's not the same size as the typical WWE arenas you see today for Raw and SmackDown, where it fits like 15 to 20,000 people. This is like about a 9,000 seat capacity venue, so you take about 2,000 off of that for the set and the amount of space that takes up. That's still maybe about six, 7,000 seats available, and you know, it was about 4,800, less than 5,000 people apparently attended this show. I don't know what crazy camera tricks they did to make it look a lot more full than it was. I'm sure they took a bunch of people out from the hard cam side and pushed them over to where the cameras were visible. You could still see some empty seats throughout the show, but it wasn't like, it wasn't near empty. It wasn't like SummerSlam this year kickoff show levels of empty, if that was any, for any kind of reference there. It, they, they did a good job making it look and sound and feel like it was a full show, despite the fact that it was so poorly attended. Joey Styles and Taz are doing commentary tonight. I really forgot how these guys sounded because I kind of tuned out watching ECW from that era, like when it was on sci-fi and everything. So I kind of forgot what they sounded like until I watched this pay-per-view. They really don't have at all the same kind of polish that like Michael Cole or Tom Phillips today does. Taz, I think, was really good with Michael Cole. Kind of a step down here with Joey Styles, even though they had an ECW connection. I feel like Taz was a little more fast and loose here. I think they were good at throwing zingers at each other throughout the whole show, in this one in particular. But that's really part of the charm of this show in general. Styles blows the uh, main event right away in the first 30 seconds of the show by saying, Tonight, a new ECW World Champion will be crowned inside the Extreme Elimination Chamber. The first match of the night, and really one of the only ones worth watching, it's Eminem versus the Hardy Boys. Now, the Hardys had just recently reunited the previous month in preparation for Survivor Series. They were part of Team DX. It's the first time they were teaming together in four years, so it was kind of a big deal. Uh, they came out together, and then on the Raw before this show, they issued an open challenge to any tag team to fight them at December to Dismember. The team that answered the challenge was Eminem, who had also recently just been disbanded. A few months before this, Joey Mercury had been suspended for wellness, so they took him off TV, and they had the team break up violently violently in order to justify that. So Nitro was on his own for a long time with Melina at ringside. So on this night, they finally come back together and without real much explanation. They build this as a one night only reunion for Eminem and that phrasing is important and we'll find out later. Also, do you know who else answered the open challenge for this match? It was Kip and BG James, the voodoo kin mafia of TNA. Those guys were known for, you know, really trying to push the envelope and overstep the boundaries because, you know, Voodoo Kin Mafia, the initials VKM, a play on Vincent Mann. Needless to say, they were not at this show. Right away as the match is beginning, you can just see Mercury and Nitro's fake tan just coming off and just leaving splotches all over the canvas. It's pretty hilarious and probably one of the big reasons that they later banned the use of fake tan spray in WWE in later years. Uh, Hardy's early on do this really interesting double team move, and I've seen this before. I don't know the name for it, but they do a double team move on a Mercury where they grab his wrists and his ankles. He's kind of upside down and they swing him back like a hammer or something. He takes a big old splat on his back. Uh, it's it's a fun move to look at, but I don't think it's a very good one to take. I've never taken it, but I've worked with a team before in the Bay Area called the Stoner Brothers, and they call that move something nasty, and it is it, 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 it is as advertised. It does not feel good to take that move, I can only assume. It's actually a really good match between these two teams. Like I said, it's one of the only ones worth watching. It's certainly one of the longest matches of the night, and it just really both teams get a lot of chance to shine and get each other's stuff in and tell a 
really good story. Part of that story involves the uh, Eminem just outright stealing the Hardys' moves at a couple of points. They hit a nice poetry in motion. Then uh, Mercury goes for a twist of fate, but he gets shoved into Nitro, who's on the top rope, and Nitro crotches himself, and Taz with his great call saying he landed right in the yam bags. Nitro right in the yam bag. In a way, the match almost feels like two separate matches stitched together, because you've got the first half of it where he's kind of like 50-50, Hardys and Eminem. Then uh, Jeff goes for a swanton, he misses, and that's how the Eminem gets their heat. I feel there was a big sudden like point in the middle of the match where it's like, okay, there's this big spot where the, the Hardys do some flying stuff, and then from there, like match two, or the second half of this match begins. It really feels like two separate stories being told, but they kind of find a way to make it all gel into one thing. It's just something that I noticed here. Uh, Melina, who by the way is screaming that this entire match, getting the whole scream thing over Super Mega and Taz, can't stop talking about it on commentary and how sexy it sounds to him. At one point, she gets on the apron and Nitro goes for a dropkick on Jeff, but Jeff dodges out of the way, and so Nitro dropkicks Melina right in the mush and she takes his big bump off the apron. It's a big spill. Eminem go for a super snapshot onto Jeff, but Matt makes the save, a double twist of fate, and then he stacks both members of Eminem up, Eminem up like cordwood, and Jeff does a swan hunt onto both of them, and the Hardys win that match. I'm going to give this one three stars out of four. Hell of a way to kick off this show, and despite the fact that there's really no build to this, and the fact that these two teams didn't really have a whole lot of heat, because they don't, only both of them just recently reunited, I think it was a spectacular way to open the show, and really, uh, you know, it, it, don't let this match, you know, cloud your judgment. The rest of the show is not going to be this good at all. They frequently said on commentary that this whole match, the Hardys are probably done as a team after this. They would, you know, amicably split and go their separate ways and pursue singles careers after this, because Jeff at this point was already the IC champion. And also, like I said earlier, Eminem said this is a one night only reunion for this matchup. And of course, both those things were false, because these two would feud for like the rest of the year and into the following month as well. Uh, they would fight again at a tag team ladder match in Armageddon the next month, which is known for two big things. One, the fact that it was also very hastily booked, a very much last minute booking decision, and two, Joey Mercury's horrific facial injury suffered at the hands of a ladder that put him on the shelf for a, quite a bit of time. Up next, Matt Stryker taking on Balls Mahoney. Now, this time, Matt Stryker was kind of a big deal in the headlines because he had recently been fired from his teaching job for using sick days to work wrestling shows during the week, which of course is a big no-no, and they really wanted to hammer home the fact that this guy is a former teacher. Like, you know, they had the ring announcer said they billed him as a former social studies teacher and not only that you've got the music with the school bell you've got him wearing the argyle tights and the sweater vest he introduces himself by saying i'm matt striker and i'm your teacher the titan tron's got a chalkboard motif no i would have no idea he's a school teacher also striker has his own face like screen printed on the back of his tights which is a very terrible decision because not only is it weird in and of itself but also the mouth portion keeps riding up his ass because that's at the crease of the tights so it just looks like his mouth is just chewing his own ass. It's Joey Styles the line of the night saying, You've got to wonder about a man who wants to sit on his own face. Huh? The whole story with this match is that it's not an Extreme Rules match, it's a Strikers Rules match, aka an Extremely Enforced Rules match, where he says there's no eye gouging allowed, no hair pulling, no foul language, it's all very naughty naughty. And the whole idea is to take Balls Mahoney out of his usual hardcore element, but in surprising fashion, he is able to do some mat wrestling early on here, some takedowns and some holds and everything. Uh, they, put, they, they put him over on commentary the fact that Balls did amateur wrestling in high school and who also punched out a referee, so uh, he has that, that, that amateur credibility there. So Striker works the arm here a lot, and, and Balls does a very good job selling the arm uh, to his credit. Striker does get a lot of heat by violating a lot of the rules that he himself wanted to enforce, like some hair pulling and some other cheating ways and stuff like that. He crotches Balls Mahoney on the top rope. Balls does make a comeback throwing a terrible back body drop. Like he's selling the arm so he doesn't have a whole body into it, so Striker just kind of takes a very horrific looking spill over the shoulder here. Uh, Balls hits a sidewalk slam, kind of a sit out move, kind of like the lowdown to win the match. I'm going to give this match one and a half stars out of four. It's a decent little match. Striker gets a lot of good heel heat here, if not a little formulaic. I was honestly surprised to see Balls hold his own in the ring doing mat wrestling stuff, so that was kind of a welcome surprise. And yeah, I think as far as like singles matches goes, this is probably one of the better ones of the night. We cut to backstage where we see Sabu, who is booked for the Extreme Elimination Chamber match in the main event, has been laid out. So another typical night for Sabu then. The fans are chanting bullshit because this means he's not going to be in the main event. Apparently the company considered Sabu to be useless in normal matches and that he was only good for like matches with stunts and weapons. I'm like, so why not keep him in a match like this where he can actually thrive and do well? If you're so concerned that, oh, he can't hold his own in a normal match, then, you know, put him in a match where he'll thrive. I thought that was kind of silly. Apparently he was also had a reputation for being un 
uninterested at TV tapings. So basically he had so much heat on him that they pulled him at the last minute, which I, you know, I read that Paul Heyman strongly objected to. Uh, Hardcore Holly would replace him later in the night. In fact, they see him, you know, Heyman backstage telling Holly, who's been in cahoots with Heyman recently on TV, that he's going to be the replacement for Sabu. And like, wow, good thing Holly was wearing his gear at the time. Up next, some tag team action as Elijah Burke and Sylvester Turkai take on the full-blooded Italians, Little Guido, aka Nunzio, and Tony Mamaluke, who I totally forgot was actually working for this company beyond like one night stand. I thought like the one night stand shows were all he did. It turns out he actually got some gigs on TV too, so good for him. Those two were accompanied by a woman named Trinity, and I had to write my brain like, who is this woman? Like, because I watched her this time, so I watched some ECW when it was around. Like, who is this woman? Was she like, did she actually work for the original ECW? I had to look her up uh, after watching. I'm like, oh no, she actually worked for TNA for a bit. Then she worked for WWE for about a year, like in the developmental system and OVW. Then she was with uh, the FBI and then didn't, didn't do much else of note, really. She was uh, canned uh, about five, six months after this match. So didn't really do much and obviously wasn't very memorable to me because I have no recollection of this woman. In a pre-match promo, Burke says he and Turkai are like wild animals in heat and they're looking to make their mark. And I'm like, really, Elijah? Is that the best metaphor you could come up with here? Uh, don't worry, folks. He'll become a better talker in the years to come when he's the Pope in Impact Wrestling. Anyway, the FBI are super over in Georgia, and I'm being super sarcastic when I say that because you can hear a pin drop when they make their entrance. This match is pretty one-sided. You see Turkai just tossing both members of the FBI around with his size and strength, and you know Burke and Nunzio get some good wrestling in as well, but it's mostly heels in this situation. Elijah hits Tony with the Elijah Experience, also known as the Skull Crushing Finale, or the Stroke, for the win here. And then right afterward, Turkai hits Little Guido with a standing muscle buster after the match is over. The fans here start to chant TNA, uh, probably because Burke was using the stroke, Jeff Jarrett's finisher, to win the match. And then, of course, Samoa Joe and the muscle buster are synonymous with each other. So the fact that Elijah, the, the fact that Turkai used the move is also very kind of, it seemed like it was taking a shot. This is when TNA was actually had a big reputation and was doing pretty well for themselves, like the 2006, 2007 era. So like this was prime time for TNA. So this is when you would hear TNA chants during WWE shows. Anyway, I'm giving this match one star out of four. It's a basic, you know, tag team match for one team to get built up. It's clearly meant to build up, you know, Burke and Turkai, which it does. It's not really a match you'd want to see on a pay-per-view necessarily, but there you go. And of course, this team wouldn't last much longer because in January, Turkai would be released. And really, no reason that I could find has been given for why he was cut because he was in the middle of a win streak at the time. So for him to get cut in that way was kind of surprising. So Burke would linger in the company for a couple more years before he left for Impact Wrestling. Up next, Tommy Dreamer takes on Davari. And no, I'm not talking about Arya Davari, who's currently on 205 Live. I'm talking about his older brother, Sean, who is, of course, most infamous for teaming with Muhammad Hassan in that first run. So after Muhammad Hassan got canned in 2005, Davari was just bopping around from like person to person, being their kind of like hype man and, and mouthpiece and everything. And really, Davari, with the great Kali here, Kali's in his corner, is really going to be one of the laziest pairings in wrestling history, one of the most like racist, jingoistic pairings in all of wrestling. It's like, hey, here are two dark-skinned wrestlers who have totally different backgrounds, like one's Indian and one's Arab American, but hey, let's put them together because they're foreign. Early on in the match, Kali pulls down the top rope and Tommy Dreamer comes spilling out to the outside. The referee catches him and throws him out, which is probably for the best because the less we see Kali attempt anything wrestling related, the better. We get some We Want Hardcore chants during this match, which, uh, ooh, bad tidings because you're not going to get it here, at least not for a little while. Hate seeing a competitor grab the neck. But now, and you see Davari doing the- So here's the finish. Dreamer fires up, he throws some punches, he puts Davari in the Tree of Woe, big running drop kick, and then he's gonna hit the DDT, but before he does, Davari drops down, rolls him up into a schoolboy, grabs the tights, and that's how Davari wins the match. So really, except for the tights pulling, Davari made Dreamer look like kind of a chump, because, you know, Davari actually used his quick abilities to just get in the position to begin with, and Dreamer, you know, this former ECW champion, total badass, is like indestructible, innovator of violence, can't kick out from his tights getting grabbed, that's some pretty shitty booking. I give this match a half star <laughs> because it was a boring match with a cheap finish. Didn't care for it. Right after the match, Dreamer is chasing Davari up the ramp, but he's intercepted by the great Kali, who does a two-handed choke slam onto the steel stage, which looks stiff as fuck. And that did not look fun to take. And that's pretty much the whole thing. You do see him, you know, getting up under his own power. So, you know, that is showing Tommy with the fighting spirit and everything. And really, you hear this just near the very end, you hear this one fan get picked up on the microphone. And this, what he says here, really encapsulates the whole show.
Up next, some mixed tag team action as Mike Knox with his girlfriend Kelly Kelly take on the resident vampires of ECW, Kevin Thorne and Ariel. It's so weird to see Mike Knox here without a big bushy beard or long hair or aces and eights gear. It's like the early Mike Knox, like, you know, in my career mode on 2K18 when you first start your guy and he doesn't have any kind of like defining characteristics to him. And then you start winning matches and you build some more money so you can buy a big beard. That's kind of what Mike Knox reminded me of here. Uh, Kelly Kelly is in the middle of her exhibitionist gimmick. She just debuted for ECW when the show began and she's, whole thing, she's a bad dancer. She doesn't know how to take her bra off or anything. But she is in the middle of the storyline where she's like, she's dating Mike Knox, but she's showing affection for CM Punk. And, and even before the match begins here, she does get on the microphone and wishes CM Punk good luck in his match, which makes Mike Knox upset. And so it is Kelly Kelly's first match in the company and it'll show really late, really soon later. During the whole match, it's mostly like, I'd say it's 85% Knox and Thorne wrestling and the women are on the outside. Ariel does a lot of screaming during this matchup. I, I wonder if Melina got pissed at her for stealing her gimmick. At one point, Ariel does tag herself in and demands that Kelly Kelly be brought in. So Knox is kind of reluctantly tags her in. So then you see Ariel just beating up Kelly Kelly a lot. Kelly doesn't know how to sell. She just basically screams and kind of like flops down. It's not a very good look. And it's really, it's sad because, you know, when you think about how she'll be by the end of her career, in WWE and how much better she gets in the ring. It's like from like day one here where she's like, she doesn't know how to take her bra off, doesn't know how to dance here in ECW. But by the end, she's like a Divas, former Divas champion. She's actually pretty competent in the ring. She's, she does some good stuff in the matches. Like, yeah, by her end of the run there, it's, it's night and day. So it's kind of sad to see her. This is the way she breaks in on television. Not a very good first impression, but really the fans don't give a shit about the wrestling because all they want to see is Ariel's ass because she's wearing like a thong and she's doing the whole boot to the throat choke thing. And like the camera's just right in there. So yeah, the story here is not about how bad Kelly Kelly is as selling. She's just, well, all the fans care about at this point is what's going on with Ariel's undergarments. The match ends when Kelly gets a moment of respite. She's able to push Ariel off. She goes for a tag, but Mike Knox walks away from her and goes back up the ramp. Oh, how dare that heel? Cause he's being humiliated by his girlfriend who's showing affection for another man. Like, I don't get why we're supposed to feel like sympathetic for Kelly and like boo Mike Knox in this situation. So anyway, Kelly gets beat up. She gets hit with this like choke, chokeslam takedown and then Ariel sits on her face for the match to be over. Ariel and Kevin Thorne win the thing. I'm gonna give it one star out of four. Like I said, the story is the women fighting, but then again, it's not really the story cause as long as Ariel's wearing that underwear, doesn't really matter. So you see Ariel uh, continue to beat up Kelly Kelly. Then out comes the Sandman. Thank God for the Sandman, the man who's been the savior of ECW the last few weeks. He's been running in and beating up the cheesy gimmicks. He comes out again. He beats up. He chases off Ariel. He beats the hell out of Kevin Thorne with a kendo stick. And that's how the bit ends there. And again, thank the Lord for the Sandman. We had to get one visit from him in this show. Main event time. It's an extreme elimination chamber match as the big show defends against Rob Van Dam, CM Punk, Test, Hardcore Holly, and Bobby Lashley. Do we love Bobby? Do we love Bobby? Uh, each pod contains a weapon of some kind, a table, a crowbar, a steel chair, and a barbed wire baseball bat. So that's how, that's the that's the extreme motif of this match, that there's like a weapon in each pod. Uh, Paul Heyman cuts a promo before the match and says, this is the dawn of the global phenomenon of ECW led by his champion, The Big Show. And Rodri says that you hear a fan yell, the seven foot tall, 500 pound Big Show. Who's gonna and what's funny is he kind of did like after this match and like a week later he was gone from the company until like february of 2008 he wouldn't come back until the build for wrestlemania 24 and his match with floyd mayweather so yeah that fan was pretty much on the money when he said it of course Heyman was a heel at this point putting all of his eggs into the big show basket and really defending big show as champion because you know a few months before this or a little bit before this i should say paul Heyman turned on rob van dam because van dam irl had gotten busted for pot possession while he was the wwe and ecw champion so in one fell swoop, they took the belts off of him. And part of that included Heyman turning his back on RVD to allow the Big Show to become the new ECW champion. And Big Show's really been on a tear for months, getting gassed every week, going against these, in these hellacious matchups with people. Every time he saw the show, match end with Big Show, it was like he was going to die. But here he is, he's being placed as this unstoppable killing machine, this monster, going against the ultimate hero, Bobby Lashley. He's definitely the baby, the, the, the king babyface as seen by the company in this bit. And I'll talk about why that's not exactly the case IRL. So you got Test coming out as well. And I think Test is a guy who like, I think there's a big missed opportunity for Test once he came back for the second run of the company. Cause I don't think it's any secret as to like why he got hired back. It has a lot to do with his physique and how much, how much bigger he got between his first run and his second run. He did have some mid-card 
hard title reigns in his first run. He was a U.S. champion and a European champ. I think he was Intercontinental champion as well. Uh, but yeah, he never really made waves with that. After the whole Stephanie McMahon wedding attempt and that not coming through because Triple H was revealed to have married her before. Like after that, they really, I feel, missed the boat with Test in general. And then they had another chance in the mid-2000s with him in ECW and they still didn't capitalize. So I felt it was kind of uh, unfortunate. The first two guys wrestling are Rob Van Dam and Bob Holly. Hardcore Holly actually had, had a bit of a career resurgence in ECW around this time. He was getting some more character development. He famously had a match with RVD on TV that he went through a table and he just got this huge gash open on his back and like he was able to carry on, finish the match and he had a bunch of stitches for it. So it really kind of helped him earn more of his stripes as a hardcore wrestler because that's certainly a hardcore thing to do to get uh, cut like that and to keep on going. CM Punk is the next man in, starts off right away by throwing his steel chair right in Bob Holly's face. And really, at this point, they're really using the cell to their advantage early on. RVD and Holly and Punk are just using like the, the cage wall and the floor, the steel floor as weapons and stuff. They're really uh, utilizing the space of the chamber in this match early on. Punk counters a Van Damme attempt and leg drops RVD's face into the chair, which causes him to be bloody. Then he throws RVD face first into a chair in the corner, and there's this great shot here where you see just his face. It's like Porky Pig in the coming through the drum. If that's all, folks, RVD's head just comes right through the opening of the chair, and you see his like bloody head just sitting there resting. Like he's passed out. It's a really good shot. Shortly after Test makes his way into the match, RVD hits CM Punk with his running drop kick to the face with the chair in the corner, then the five-star frog splash, and CM Punk is the first man eliminated. And the crowd was funny here, because you hear first going, yay, RVD, and they realize, boo, CM Punk is gone, and we want him to win. And that was really, I think Punk getting the, being the first one taken out certainly smacks of the company thumbing their nose at what a lot of the fans and what the popular opinion was of Punk at the time, and certainly to spite Paul Heyman, it would seem, because Heyman allegedly vouched very much for CM Punk to win this match, and even actually start things off by eliminating the Big Show early on with a submission to really put him over as this giant killer and this world beater, so to speak. So uh, clearly the company was like, nope, we got our man in Bobby Lashley, fuck CM Punk. And so uh, that was not to be here. So that was the beginning of a long, arduous climb for CM Punk into his championship status. He would eventually get, right after CM Punk gets eliminated, Test hits Bob Holly with a huge big boot and eliminates him, even though that felt like a kind of a sloppy elimination because I didn't hear the referee count to three. It just didn't sound like the three count was made and did Bob Holly kick out? What happened? No, he's just gone. Okay, that was kind of an awkward little moment there. Holy cover! One up, one up, one up. RVD goes to the top of the Big Show's pod to do something, but the show is grabbing him by the leg, keeping him from moving. That allows Test to hit RVD a couple times with the chair, grabs him by the ponytail, and just beals him off the top of the pod into the ring, and that alone's a scary enough bump. But then Test puts a chair on RVD, goes to the top of the pod himself, and does a huge flying elbow drop onto RVD. That looked horrific. I was afraid Test's leg was going to shatter upon impact there. It did not look good. So RVD's eliminated. So you have Big Show still left in his pod. He's the last one to come out, but then you've got Test in the ring and Bobby Lashley is next. So Lashley has seen all this happen. He's about to come out, but then Heyman's riot squad, the goon squad as Styles calls them, uh, keeps Lashley in his pod. But Lashley, ever the resourceful one, grabs the edge of the table in his pod and uses it to break the chains above him so he's able to climb out that way. He and Test fight for a bit. He decks Test in the stomach with a crowbar, followed by a spear. Test is eliminated, and so then you've got Lashley and Big Show, who's still in his pod, and they have a whole minute of time pass before, you know, when Test is gone, and then La and then Big Show's pod finally opens. You see Lashley stalking his prey, and Big Show doesn't seem very phased by it. So Big Show's got his barbed wire ball bat, and then he finally starts swinging over at Lashley. Lashley's deflecting it with a chair. Kind of a cool little sequence here where, like, he's really trying to defend himself against this monster, this giant with this deadly weapon in his hand. A show swings the bat into the cage wall, and he gets stuck. That allows Lashley to get in advantage. Show gets tossed through the pod glass, so Lash is looking amazingly strong here as Paul Heyman is going into a conniption fit at what he is seeing here. Show goes for a slam, but Lashley rolls off, hits a spear, Lashley wins the championship, and now Destiny has finally reached where it meant to go all along. Lashley has uh, defied the odds to become the new ECW champion. Boy, defying the odds sounds like a familiar motif, doesn't it? I'm going to give this match two and a half stars out of four. I think it was a good twist on the standard Elimination Chamber setup. I think the space they used was well utilized here and using it as a weapon. The, the additional weapons added in this match gave it just a little bit of spice that made it different and stand out from the traditional chamber matches before and after this. So I think everyone did okay in the match. Big props to RVD and CM Punk and Tess for what they
they did in this match in particular. I think everyone did well, all things considered, and the story was pretty solid as well. So after this matchup, Sho had one more match, a rematch with Bobby Lashley on TV, and then he would officially go on hiatus until February of 2008 when he came back for WrestleMania 24. Lashley, of course, would go on to fight Umaga the next year at WrestleMania 23 with Donald Trump, the future president of the United States, in his corner. And then he would feud with Vincent Mann after McMahon was shaved bald. They'd fight for the ECW championship. Lashley would lose to McMahon, win it back, then drop it once again when he was drafted to Raw. But he was never really able to live up to his, you know, main event world champion potential. He seemed it seemed so obvious that what they were penning him in for. So he would leave the company in 2008. He'd bounce around between AAA, TNA, and MMA. Of course, now he's doing pretty well for himself in Impact Wrestling, fighting for Bellator. He was recently the winner of all the belts in Impact. So I think he, he's grown so much. If you just watch Lashley now in Impact compared to like what he was then, obviously, you know, it's been 10 or 11 years. So you're going to get more experience, but he just seems so much more seasoned, so much better now. Like I feel that they really tried to do too much too soon with Lashley in that first couple years with him. I think that, he, you know, hypothetically speaking, if he came back to WWE tomorrow, I could see him being in the world title picture and even, maybe even winning it in those first six months. My final grade for December to December 2006 is a D+. Uh, the good matches were good. Hardy's and Eminem, great match. Extreme Elimination Chamber, fun way to end the show. But man, literally every other match was just not pay-per-view caliber, clearly thrown together. This is their matches you could have seen not only on ECW, you probably could have seen them on on whatever the equivalent was of like Jacked or Metal or Velocity. These are matches that did not belong on pay-per-view, really in any capacity. Uh, the questionable booking of the Extreme Elimination Chamber, I think that it, I think it would have made some, a much bigger impact had CM Punk at least done well in the match and not been the first one eliminated. Maybe not have him win the whole thing right off the bat, but it would have been interesting to see him get that far. And then, uh, then the biggest thing, I think the biggest problem with this show is the fact it was a dreadfully short pay-per-view. Only ran just a bit under two hours and 20 minutes, which again, if fans just watched Survivor Series the previous week, then they put down another $30 or $40 for a pay-per-view seven days later, they damn well be get, better be getting a full-length pay-per-view. But they got cheated out of that. And so it's just so many things working against it. I don't know if it's a fault of the people in charge of producing this show not knowing, well, gosh, we don't have any more ECW people to put in matches. How are we going to fill this time? They already had to borrow Raw and SmackDown people for that opening tag team match. And it's the only one of the only matches worth watching. It was just poorly put together poorly executed and again with the exception of a couple with, with with the exception of a couple of matches there wasn't much else to talk about of course creatively this was the straw that broke the camel's back for Paul Heyman he would be sent home after this event Vincent Mann tried to blame Heyman for the show's poor offering but Heyman you know you can't blame Heyman for trying to do things his way now he's not perfect 100% of the time but when he's right he's right he apparently told Vince that you know they're going to throw this back in our faces what what we have planned right now he didn't think Lashley should have won the championship and so I think Heyman was right in hindsight that the fact the fans did not appreciate this match. It was, you know, not only, even if, you know, despite the low turnout and a low buy rate, you hypothetically could have had an amazing show, you know, it just all, it all comes down to marketing essentially at that point, but they didn't. So not only are the numbers bad, but the reviews are bad because the rest of the show is just so poor compared to this, you know, this special Raw versus SmackDown exhibition they had at the top of the show and the Elimination Chamber match at the end where some would argue the wrong guy won. So yeah, Heyman was gone after this show show because he and Vince and Stephanie butted heads so often and this was finally the boiling point for all parties involved. He wouldn't be seen in the company for years until CM Punk was the world champion and then he was finally coming to being in CM Punk's corner and really kind of bringing things full circle to him being the CM, uh, for CM Punk being the Paul Heyman guy. To give you another example or an idea of how much of a failure this show was, Tommy Dreamer and Stevie Richards who worked a dark match on this show that night, uh, both wanted to be released from the company and the company refused. So yeah, <laughs> people wanted to jump from this sinking ship apparently in, in the eyes of people who were there from the original the original ECW people the poor reception and the low buy rate meant that this was the first and last ECW branded show but not only was this the one and only brand exclusive show for ECW this was the final brand exclusive pay-per-view for a long time the last one of the first version of the brand split this show essentially killed the concept and whether or not that's coincidence maybe they had planned to not do any more single brand pay-per-views anymore after this point but this show certainly didn't help and that's a you know this is it's known for being one of the worst and certainly the last brand exclusive pay-per-view of the first brand split and it's very telling that this is how it went out
So what did you guys think of December to Dismember? Let me know in the comments section below. And thanks once again to Joel Ma for nominating this show for me to review. If you want to play a role in what classic shows I review in the future, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the opportunity to nominate shows for me to review in the future on this segment. Next time, I'm going to fit one more classic pay-per-view review in before the year is up. And because it's December, i got to do a Starcade show. But, you know, most people would say Starcade 97, but surprisingly, nobody nominated Starcade 97 before this point. So now I'm going to do the next best thing, Starcade 98. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.